do, um, mostly in mobile and social sensing for, for real-time problems. Um, so in terms of, of, of that, I'm going to focus my talk. It's going to be a little bit of a tutorial, and then I'm going to uh, introduce you to uh, some of the things that, uh, that others have done and things that we're currently working on here. Um, so we start off with uh, what is mobile sensing, because I, I sometimes get the impression, judging by uh, the CIS talks and things like that, that there's a lot of video people, and so you may not do a lot of mobile sensing. Um, and so we'll look at the motivation and the types of sensors and, uh, and things like that. Um, finally, in, in the second half, we're going to concentrate on a specific area in mobile sensing, um, and that is in uh, applications in the safety and, and crowd monitoring uh, domain. So what is mobile sensing? That's the, the, the first uh, thing to address. Well, mobile sensing is, is very simply the use of mobile sensors to collect information. And uh, so what we've got these days is we've got uh, smartphones uh, which are equipped with a variety of microsensors. Okay? And every year we get more and more microsensors equipped in our phones. Uh, you think five years ago about what your phone could do versus today is a lot different. Um, so we've got things uh, uh, that we're all used to, uh, GPS, uh, we've got uh, Bluetooth, uh, but lots of things that uh, you might not be as used to. Um, you've got your accelerometers and your barometers and things like that that are usually used for very application specific things. But of course, essentially somebody's come along and gone, oh, look, we can do a lot of other things with these phones than just, uh, just application things. So apart from the fact that phones themselves are capable of doing so much now, the other thing that's very important in terms of uh, the, our ability to do uh, mobile sensing is smartphone adoption. So there's usually at least one. Who in the audience doesn't have a smartphone? Anybody? Oh, not even one today. So there you go. That goes to show you, certainly in, uh, in kind of uh, Western countries and, uh, and lots of other countries as well. You've got uh, Italy, Spain, uh, well, Western countries, I'm thinking China, India. But you can see that every year the penetration of smartphones is increasing, okay, even in, in uh, other uh, areas. And so because we have so many people carrying phones, okay, um, we can do a lot of uh, things, a, a lot of sensing that we, we didn't used to be able to do. So in terms of uh, where I'm going to go now is we're going to have a little bit of an overview of the kinds of sensors that we would use in mobile sensing. Um, I'm not going to go through them all. If you're interested in using other ones or if you get involved in the domain of, of smart sensing and find that you need to use other ones, um, then, uh, then the, there's lots of information available out there. But kind of some of the most popular ones are, are, are ones that deal with uh, position, uh, motion, environment, and audio video. So position, you've got GPS, you've got uh, Bluetooth as well, um, and you've also got Wi-Fi, which uh, uh, enables us to do uh, positioning as well. So I'll just skip into the actual details uh, in terms of, of, of which kinds of sensors I'm going to go through. Um, so the kind of most basic and most power-hungry one is Bluetooth. Okay? Um, in back uh, when smartphones first became widely available, Bluetooth was by default on. Okay? And uh, very rapidly, people uh, worked out that it was a, a big consumer of what? Anybody know? Battery. Okay? Bluetooth drains your battery, uh, at least the old traditional style of Bluetooth. But one of the things that made it a very attractive proposition for, uh, for mobile sensing uh, was the fact that at least initially, it was something that was by default turned on. Okay? And it's also something that you can do passively. So what do I mean? You don't need a user's uh, uh, permission for Bluetooth to be, uh, for you to collect the Bluetooth information from a phone. If your Bluetooth is on right now, if I have an app that is scanning for Bluetooth signals, I can discover you, okay? There's no agreement on your part. You don't need to have any app to do that installed on your phone. By default, it, it, it gets that information. Okay? And that's actually a, a big uh, privacy concern um, as we go into the world of uh, uh, being worried about uh, protecting our identities. Um, Bluetooth can also be used for indoor positioning. Um, it's uh, really good for also getting spatial temporal uh, data, so about uh, participant mobility and social interactions. You can, you can imagine that because Bluetooth has a range of about 10 meters, okay, um, the social interactions, the people that I come across 
in a day are detectable by Bluetooth, okay? And the order in which I come across them. So in fact, some of the earlier studies, uh, uh, some of the first studies in mobile sensing uh, with uh, uh, Pentland uh, at MIT uh, focused on exactly that. It, they looked at mapping the activities of daily life by mapping the people you came across uh, using both Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi and, or no, they didn't use Wi-Fi, sorry, they used a, a cell. So, coming up on the foot of, uh, of, uh, of Bluetooth is, is something that is, is very, very promising in terms of mobile sensing and, and detecting uh, the behaviors of people, and that's something called iBeacon, okay? iBeacon, or Bluetooth Smart, okay, is, uh, is used as a part of a uh, very successful indoor positioning. Um, it, it increases the accuracy uh, of, uh, of indoor positioning by, by quite a great uh, amount, and uh, you can so you can go about uh, sensing things in, in uh, iBeacon or Bluetooth Smart in a couple of different ways. You can actually get uh, the, the distance in meters uh, to quite a high degree of accuracy. But if you're not concerned about that, you can use uh, Apple's uh, predefined uh, ones, which are, uh, they define devices that are around me as intermediate, near, far, or unknown. Okay. Um, so iBeacon is, uh, if you've got an iPhone um, as a kind of, I think it's from uh, 5 onwards, or 5S, um, is already equipped with iBeacon technology. So you can see that this is a newer type of sensor that is moving into the Android market as well with, uh, with Bluetooth Smart. Wi-Fi, um, Wi-Fi technology we're all familiar with, but we can also use it as indoor positioning systems. Um, it's uh, also good for uh, detecting crowd densities. Um, so typically, uh, we combine GPS and cell tower triangulation to get uh, improved accuracy for, for location. Um, and so one of the things that you should be aware of is that uh, the reason we need Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and Bluetooth Smart in terms of indoor positioning is that GPS is, of course, not at all reliable indoors. It, it essentially does not work. Okay? So GPS satellite navigation systems, We've all, we're all very familiar with those. Um, it gives us the location, uh, latitude, and longitude of uh, the device, okay? Um, so the average accuracy is about three meters outside, but not suitable for indoors. Uh, we have also our compass, which uh, measures uh, direction and uh, allows us to, uh, to, to figure out which way a person is walking. So for example, in maps, uh, when, you, when it's, uh, it, it tri triangulates on which direction you're pointing, okay, it uses a combination of, of uh, compass and uh, accelerometer. So the magnometer is another sensor which has, a, has some limited use. And the biggest problem with the magnometer is this, okay? it's calibration. Uh, the magnometer requires uh, cal calibration, and it's sensitive to magnetic fields coming from um, metal uh, objects and electric motors. So before we go into accelerometer, just a, a quick uh, uh, overview when you're talking about roll. Okay, So you've got the plane uh, as an example. So that's what it's talking about. Yaw is uh, when it pitches. Uh, uh, pitches um, and then you've got uh, sway, or sorry, heave and sway. Okay, those are the, the basic things that we've got on, um, on our accelerometer. So the heave is the side to side, and the sway is the, the kind of uh, uh, front to back motion. So quickly, uh, accelerometer. Uh, accelerometer is one of the more popular ones in terms of, uh, of looking at uh, uh, crowd sensing. Uh, an accelerometer, it measures the force of acceleration of the device. You've got three axes, the uh, surge, heave, and sway, okay? And you can calculate the pitch and roll using uh, uh, trigonometric calculations. And uh, we use it, uh, so in terms of applications, okay, uh, we, the phone itself uses the accelerometer to determine the orientation of your device as you're holding it. So the very simple switching, phone, phone screen switching as you, you, you kind of uh, want to switch from landscape to portrait um, is, is, is determined by that. So the other thing we've got, uh, I think this is the last sensor I'll go through, is the gyroscope, okay? And you've got, uh, again, three axes. And it tells you how much your device is being rotated over time, OK? Um, 
it's a power expensive uh, sensor and uh, it's, it's, uh, not as no it's not noisy but it's inaccurate. Okay? Um, so the last thing I'm going to, to talk about in terms of sensing is uh, just a, a, an advertisement of, of some of the things that are available out there. And this is actually something that we've created here at, at Queen Mary. And uh, this is the sensing kit uh, platform. And what's really handy in terms of doing mobile sensing is not, being, not having to develop your, your sensor collections uh, yourself. Okay? Um, so as we'll move into describing uh, uh, sensing, mobile sensing, you'll see that we all want to collect all the sensor data. And uh, one of the things, one of the challenges in mobile sensing is being able to do it cross-platform. Okay? So we have in, in um, we've got Android, we've got iPhone, we've got Windows 8. All of those different uh, platforms, of course, as you can imagine, require different uh, different installations of your device or different libraries, okay? And uh, one of the things we've developed here is a, a, a cross-platform uh, cross library that allows you to, to quickly get uh, the device stuff that you need, okay? It's a nice and modular and extensible and uh, available under uh, open source license, so you're welcome to add or change uh, to it. So, Getting into that, getting into uh, mobile sensing scale. So that was just a bit about the sensors that we collect from. And now we're going to talk about the details of, of what we're interested in. So in mobile sensing, generally, we, uh, we describe it in terms of the level of scale that we want to sense from someone. So we've got personal, uh, group, and community. So there's uh, some examples here. So what do we mean by personal? Well, personal is individual sensing. So you should all be familiar, kind of even more so, with wearables, right? Wearables, you've got, uh, you've got the, the, uh, uh, the fitness devices. Um, you've got the ones that uh, the Apple Watch, all of those coming out. But our phone is actually capable of, of doing this as well. So in terms of the quantified self, what do I mean? Well, this is collecting data about you by you, okay? And you're using it for some sort of personal, individual um, reason. So an example might be exercise, right? So you've got your phone in your pocket. Uh, here's an example of, uh, of uh, map, uh, map My Run, I think it is. And uh, it collects information, GPS traces, about where you're running during the course of, of your, your exercise. It calculates how many steps you've done. Might even try and make some uh, estimations as to how many calories you've burnt. Um, and so, so that's what we mean there. Uh, other health type apps involve different levels of data collection. And that's one of the things that we'll be talking about as well, is what kind of data, what kind of sensor data are we collecting? Because when we talk about mobile sensing, we're not actually just talking about the sensor data that we can collect from the sensors that I just discussed, okay? But they also qualify um, kind of anything you enter in your mobile phone, let's say through an app or something like that, as also sensor data. So in this case, Weight Watchers, obviously we don't have uh, yet the ability to be able to track our calories uh, using an accelerometer to find out how much food we put in our mouths. And even if we, we could do that, right, the problem is, what is the, 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 the makeup of the food, right? What is the calorie content? Are you eating cake or are you eating celery, okay? Um, so apps like Weight Watchers rely on uh, user input um, uh, to basically uh, motivate and, and track uh, your weight over time. Okay, we've also got things like sleep, okay? Anybody run across sleep apps? Anybody used one? Yeah, a few people. So one of the, the things uh, that, that you can do these days is you can take your phone and you can put it, I think it's usually underneath the pillow, isn't it? You put your phone underneath the pillow as you go to sleep at night, you set it on quick mode, and what it does is it actually uses the accelerometer in your phone to basically uh, figure out how, how restful a sleep you've had. Okay? So it, it measures whether or not how many times you roll over, how many times you move around. And some of them actually have audio sensors as well. Um, and so they're actually trying to detect uh, whether or not you have any sleep apnea, whether you're snoring or whether perhaps if you're awake as well. Um, I found it of, uh, it of limited appeal, but people do say that they're, they're, they're quite useful. I think if you have severe sleep problems, they can be uh, quite handy. Uh, carbon footprint. So other types of apps, what they do is they use uh, the accelerometer to measure your carbon footprint. And, and we'll look at an example of that in a little bit. Um, so they, they try and figure out, uh, they try and classify the activity that you're currently doing. Are you walking? Are you running? Are you on a bus? 
Okay. So essentially, individual sensing is data collected by and about the self. We get one level up in abstraction, and, and uh, we've got something called group sensing. And they tend to be, again, a little bit, uh, uh, quite a lot of crossover into the individual sensing. So they tend to be groups of, of uh, self-interested people around a certain domain. So uh, an example might be something like garba Garbage Watch, where uh, essentially what they did is they, they had a group of users who took pictures about, of garbage okay, and posted them, and they, 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 uh, they upload photos of recycling bins uh, to basically try and encourage more recycling. Okay? Similarly, you might have joint weight loss apps. So the second you start uh, networking out to other people, I might have the Weight Watchers app, and then I've got a whole bunch of friends, and we might you know, track together uh, our, our aggregate weight loss over the course of a month. Okay? Or fitness. Okay? So kind of where I'm more focused in the research that, that I do is, is in the area of community sensing. Okay? Uh, so community sensing and, and or, or mobile crowd sensing. And what this is, is there are individuals with sensing and commuting devices that collectively share information to map phenomena. Okay? Um, so you might be looking at, uh, at, at traffic patterns over the course of a whole city. You might be looking for uh, route mapping. Um, there's a, a whole variety of different things that, that you can do. So if we look over here, I mean, these people don't have mobile devices, but essentially what they're, they're trying to do is they're trying to source out bits of uh, uh, the painting of the Mona Lisa. So rather than having it done by one great artist, let's say we can all do a little bit of it. We're going to uh, each paint a little corner of it. Um, and uh, so what we're trying to, to do is harness the, the power of, of, of crowdsourcing. Uh, okay? So why do we want the crowdsourced information? What benefit can it gain? And in fact, lots of different companies are, are out there using these kinds of applications, and, and, uh, but, but why? So kind of one of the early examples uh, in, in the Wisdom of Crowds uh, book um, is, uh, is an example from a county fair. Okay? And you might say, well, what has an ox got to do with anything here? But it's an example of, of why you might want to have crowdsourcing. Uh, what, is the, what, what is the weight of this ox? So what is the weight of this ox? So at a county fair, uh, essentially, they, they came along and they, you got people to guess the weight of the ox. Experts as well, so people who, who, uh, who actually purchase cattle, who are very familiar uh, with uh, you know, how to judge the weight of, uh, of uh, an ox. And they come along and they guess, you know, one might guess 900 pounds, another 1,000, 2,000, etc. Okay? And the surprising thing that they found here is that the best guess, the closest guess, okay, was the average of everyone's guesses. That was the actual closest guess to the true weight of the ox. Okay? So that's just a, a little analogy as to why crowd, crowdsourcing. But how do we do it using phones? Okay? When we're using phones, we've got a couple of different models. Uh, so the topology of, of crowd sensing is, first of all, and we, we frame it in terms of user involvement. Okay? How much involvement does it require from my user? Um, and so you've got two ends here. You've got participatory sensing and opportunistic sensing. So in the participatory sensing model, the user takes the measurement itself. So in, in an example here, you might have a, a water watch uh, or pollution monitoring. You might have some sort of sensor built into your phone that allows us to, to detect pollution. Okay? And so in that case, what you would have is you would have a group of users go out with an application installed. They would take readings. Okay, at various points to determine the pollution of a specific area. Okay? It requires user engagement, right? So that means that you need to incentivize your users. What is it in it for them to participate? Okay? In some cases, it might be, it might be a, a kind of a, for the social good. In other cases, they're expecting something back. Uh, another example might be uh, there, there's been various different crowdsourced uh, and crowd-sensed models of bike net. Okay? So trying to improve the routing for, for bicycles because, of course, bicycles don't necessarily need to use roads. They can use parks and other types of, uh, of, of routes that aren't typically available through mapping. Okay? And so what they do is they use crowdsourcing to actually uh, get the information from, from the user. Um, so in participatory sensing, we've got a high degree of, of, of uh, user, user involvement. 
And as we move towards opportunistic sensing, we have a low degree. And in some cases, the users may not even be aware that they are actually participating, which, of course, brings us a whole load of ethical and privacy implications. There's been lots of cases recently in the news of apps that are recording your data without you knowing it. Okay? So in opportunistic sensing, uh, we have a lot of background data collection, and we're constantly collecting information. Opportunistic sensing also has some other issues in terms of, of, of things like battery usage. So in participatory sensing, you're taking individual readings. Okay? In opportunistic sensing, the phone's just doing it for you in the background. Okay? And that brings us an architectural challenge in that a lot of these sensors are very power hungry. They drain your battery in no time if you let them, let them uh, sample all the time. And so certainly there needs to be a trade-off in terms of the amount of data that we need to collect and how often we sample. So the other uh, topology of crowd sensing is in terms of the data collection. Is it explicit or implicit? And it's again wrapped up with this whole idea of user involvement. Um, so how much uh, explicit uh, allows us to... to the user to actually get the data uh, individually, whereas implicit just collects it without our knowledge. So I've kind of talked about some of these other uh, areas. So in terms of kind of a, a topology of the types of things that is done with mobile crowd sensing, uh, they are generally uh, uh, put into three different categories, which are environmental, uh, infrastructure, and social. Okay, so environmental, the example on air pollution, infrastructure, traffic congestion, uh, congestion traf uh, parking availability, um, and social, uh, so we can share and compare. So the general steps for any sensing, crowd sensing uh, system is that we need to collect, collect the information, we need to extract it, things about it and then classify. So what we have is we've got uh, the raw data coming from our sensors. We need to uh, capture that data and store it somewhere. Okay? This has a, a, a range as well because certainly in, with explicit sensing, um, the amount of data coming in here can actually be monumental. Uh, and as you up the number of users, you get more and more data. Okay? So you need to have a good backup systems to, to store, uh, the, to get the data reliably and store it. Okay? Um, you need to extract features, um, so uh, data analysis um, in terms of getting different features, usually for, uh, for classification. So typically then we, we then use some sort of machine learning, a, 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 classify, or a clustering algorithm or a classifying algorithm uh, that, uh, that gets us some information. So as an example, okay, uh, Ashton et al. Uh, looked at, uh, at, at mobility states uh, using an accelerometer. So they were interested in, in what state is a user in depending on the, the state of the accelerometer over time. Okay? And so what they did is they, they did some sampling just using an, the accelerometer from a mobile phone, um, uh, 4 hertz over 2 second samples, and they, they then looked for peaks and, and troughs as features. Okay, I've not included any information about that, but you can imagine that your accelerometer readings have got a peak and a trough, and those are what you're looking for in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, detecting uh, mobility states. And so then they looked at, well, okay, so in terms of uh, the human mobility states, what uh, readings of uh, peaks and troughs uh, allow us to get uh, the, the information that, uh, that we need. And uh, I think they, they, they were generally fairly successful, but I think that one of the things that they had problems with was, uh, was detecting uh, somebody walking, or no, it's a bicycle and a slow moving bus. And most of you okay, are familiar with Google Maps. You are already likely participants in crowd, uh, crowd, uh, map, or crowd, crowd sensing. Okay? If you have installed Google Maps, if you use Google Maps, if you have not explicitly turned off the data collection, Google Maps is in the background on your phone collecting information about your movements. Okay? And so it uses that information to essentially allow it to update those uh, red and yellow uh, and green bits on uh, Google Maps to find out the traffic congestion. So when they first introduced the system, it wasn't very reliable, but as more and more people used it, they found uh, that they could, actually, you, they could actually distinguish between somebody stopping for coffee um, and, uh, and, and a traffic jam. OK? 
okay? Because, of course, you know, it's certainly on motorways and things like that, the coffee stop's going to be, like, right by the side, so your GPS isn't accurate enough to, 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 for you to say, well, they're not on the road anymore. Uh, so if you had, you know, five people stop for coffee, that might be a traffic jam. But, uh, of course, Google is smarter than that, um, and they, they rely on much more information. Uh, another example is uh, for trip planning is, is, is using uh, GPS trace da data from taxis and combining it with Foursquare. Okay? And this, uh, for this particular uh, crowd sensing application, what they're looking for here is, is actually to allow tourists to do uh, route planning, to visit uh, the, the most amount of, uh, of, of things within a city uh, with the minimal, min minimal travel time. Okay? So... The second half of uh, my talk is going to focus on, in on uh, some of the, the research uh, around safety and uh, crowd monitoring and mobile sensing. Okay? So what do I mean by safety and crowd monitoring? So one of the things that we're quite interested in is being able to detect uh, topology of, uh, of the crowd. So what do I mean by topology of the crowd? We need to know uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of kind of evacuation and safety uh, measures what the crowd consists of. So how dense is it? How many people are, are, are crammed into this area? If we have 30 people in this room, we're, we're quite loosely packed, but if you have this room size, okay, the density, of course, of the crowd becomes tighter. Okay? It becomes more dense. Um, you're looking for the size. So how many people are here? Is it 50? Is it 1,000? Is it a million? Okay? Um, you're looking for the type of crowd. Now, this is a little bit more general um, in terms of there's, there's lots of kind of competing research that I don't have time to go through that basically uh, classifies the crowd in terms of, uh, of types. And they, they classify types in terms of different, uh, different characteristics, so size, density, and things like that. And so different types of crowd are more likely to, to lead to problematic behavior, crushing, um, or, or things like that. Uh, another thing that we might be interested in in, in safety and, and uh, crowd monitoring is groups within groups. So imagine a protest, okay? We've got a protest of people, fairly densely packed crowd, but we've got groups within that crowd that are moving uh, together, okay? We, they're, they're, they're perhaps moving in different, different from the rest of the crowd. And what we'd like to be able to do is be, to be able to detect those groups within groups and look at which groups are behaving normally and which groups are not, okay? Uh, turbulence uh, is also another issue, which is, uh, which is kind of, the, the, again, a, a movement statistic uh, with crowd monitoring. Um, and the important thing here is that when we're dealing with safety and crowd monitoring, the, the overall aim of all of this is real time. Okay? We want real time data collection, cleaning, proce and processing. Okay? It's, it's too late to say that there's a problem an hour after the event. Okay? Uh, we need to know uh, as quickly as possible. So, some research uh, that looked at Bluetooth-based uh, mobility and interaction. Uh, this is actually uh, takes place at a, a music festival. Okay, and so this uh, in this music festival, they looked at uh, the Bluetooth Bluetooth monitoring. They collected the Bluetooth signals by uh, having a, a small subset, 155 people armed with sensors that they used as scanners. And so what they did is they took the, the festival location, uh, they divided it up into 10 by 10 squares, and uh, basically uh, this is the, the density of sampling points that they, they, they managed to get. So if you kind of look at the overall spatial area, you can see that, that there's a lot of areas that were never sampled at all uh, by, um, by the, the uh, sensors. Uh, and certainly in the center you get the core amount of, 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 of sampling that occurs right over the stage area. Okay? And so they found with some success that they, they, they could actually uh, do quite a lot of uh, uh, inference about the mobility and, and, and social interactions uh, within that crowd. Uh, more recently, um, I think, oh no, this is, yeah, this one is a, a little bit more recent. Um, it's uh, crowd topography, uh, again using Bluetooth and, and um, uh, no, sorry, it uses GPS traces and, and Wi-Fi fingerprinting. And so this particular piece of research came out, uh, it was actually done in London with a, a collaboration with city police. And what they were looking at is uh, the behavior of pedestrians during the Lord Mayor's Parade. Okay? So they've got a parade going through London and they're looking at, at being able to give the police valuable information about 
uh, about the crowd and its current behaviors. And so if you take a look here, they've got heat maps, essentially, of uh, various things they've calculated by collecting the, these uh, GPS traces and, uh, and fingerprints. Um, and so you've got the density distribution. You can see that here we've got a, a potential problem area occurring. Um, and then you've got other things like uh, crowd movement, velocity, um, turbulence, and uh, crowd pressure. So uh, again, so in terms of crowd pressure, if crowd pressure is an issue, then, uh, then you've got that, uh, that, that hot spot appearing there. Okay? And uh, just, uh, just off the, the press for uh, Bata et al., um, they found that you could actually quantify uh, crowd size with just Twitter information and internet activity or, uh, and, uh, and, and calls and SMS. So this particular uh, piece of research, what they did is they collected, uh, they collected the calls and SMS activity and internet activity uh, around uh, Milan. Okay, over the period of uh, about three months. Okay, and so what they're looking at, of course, here you've got you've got hot spots of uh, of activity. The Twitter activity, you might say, well, what did they collect in terms of Twitter? Well, in terms of Twitter, what they actually collected is they collected uh, they collected uh, geotagged tweet tweets. So this is an important thing when you look at this research. So. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, data collection in online social networks, but one of the things with Twitter and geotag tweets is that they represent a notoriously small amount of the data set. Most people don't geotag their tweets, and in fact, what we do need to do is look for other signifiers in the, the, the Twitter stream as to the location of those tweets. But Interestingly, of course, this is all normalized, uh, uh, so we don't actually know what the maximum number of tweets that they, they calculated uh, in, in this, this particular graph were. However, interestingly, though, they still found that with those, uh, between the mobile phone usage and Twitter usage, that you can actually estimate the number of people in any one given location. And so, as an example, they took uh, a stadium in Milan, uh, the Stadio uh, San Siro, and uh, they looked at uh, the call and SMS activity, internet activity, and Twitter activity, and looked at the spikes over uh, the period of time. And you can see that in each one of these data sets, there is, a, is uh, 10 spikes in total, and they all roughly uh, correspond to the exact same time frames that also, coincidentally, correspond to match day. Okay, so on each match day, there was a, a, a spike in SMS activity, internet activity, and Twitter activity in the specific location. And uh, again, the relative sizes of these peaks uh, show very, a, a high degree of similarity to the sizes of actual attendance counts in the, in the uh, Milan Stadium. Okay? Of course, they, they, they looked at a few other data sets, not just this one before they, they uh, announced that they could do this. But it's uh, quite telling that, uh, that just that small sample size of the number of people there uh, lets us get, give a very accurate estimation of uh, crowd size. So that brings me to some of the things that we are doing here, which is sensing crowd events in online social networks. Okay? So online social networks are often used as, a, as a, a, a sensor in mobile phones because most of us use our mobile phones to post statuses as we go around to post photos. We might use Foursquare or Twitter. Um, and so one of the things that we'd like to be able to do is, is be able to look at the, the crowd sentiments uh, or sub-events of a particular uh, crowded event, okay? And so what do I mean by crowd sentiment? Well, one of the, the, the kind of current branches that we're taking a look at is to see whether or not there's any relationship between the, the overall sentiment of the crowd, okay? I'm not gonna get into the details of sentiment analysis. It's probably beyond what we're going to go to here. But so sentiment analysis is essentially just mining through the text and looking at the sentiment of, uh, of the words in each tweet, okay? And so we get a general feeling of the sentiment and whether or not there's any relationship between that and the current crowd conditions, okay? Um, another important thing in crowd monitoring is sub-events, okay? So we want to be able to find out uh, what is happening in the context of, uh, let's say, a music festival. So in a music festival, we've got bands that come on, Fine, very interesting. It allows us to be able to predict, you know, to, to, to say that, you know, there's, there's little peaks at the time that a particular band comes on. But 
One of the other things we'd like to be able to find out is any kind of emergency scenarios, any unusual events. So, for example, in Glastonbury, I think it was uh, uh, in 2013, there was a, um, a rather unusual event in terms of uh, one of the, the, the singers had, uh, had their baby in the audience. And the baby actually crowd surfed in its pram, in its push chair, to, the, uh, to the, the, the front of the stage to you know, wave hello to his father or her father. I don't know if it was a girl or boy. Uh, but of course, that of course caused, caused a, a, a Twitter storm, right? It caused an outrage in, in some cases. Uh, some cases, uh, people thought, oh, how cool is that? But uh, again, uh, something that, that, that appears in, in our sub-events and is potentially a dangerous situation, okay? So, one of the problems is that in terms of when we're doing um, monitoring of online social networks and looking for these kinds of things, typically what we do is we, we, might set, uh, we might collect information from the whole event. So we collect information from the whole event and we usually do it with just a few search keywords. So for instance, if you were collecting information for Glastonbury, without knowing, I mean, I know the lineup is published, but without knowing what the lineup is, okay, um, you, you could say, well, well, I, I'd like to be able to actually make sure that I get all the information for uh, that event. And so if you just used the hashtag Glastonbury to collect your information on, you would miss a whole load of information because what happens? Well, the baby crowd surfing, as an example, it might appear, people might not actually include the Glastonbury hashtag in there, okay? And so just as a, a little example here, with some of the, the work that we've done, we've, we've used those baselines. So in the red is, is how much information you would collect just using a, a, a collection of standard keywords. And in the blue is, is information you could collect by adaptively changing your crawler to collect things as it was needed. Um, why do we need to do that? Okay, I, I kind of mentioned that already, but here's another example from the Olympics, is that sometimes uh, the selection of, of words is subjective and new words arise during your, your search, okay? So in the first case, we've got Olympics. This is an example from the Olympics. But in the second case, this refers to the, a game played at the Olympics as well, but has no mention of, uh, of Olympics in the actual tweet, okay? So we want to be able to collect that information as well. So what are we doing? Well, we're adaptively crawling to collect an extended set of tweets by automatically identifying keywords, okay? So I thought I'd include this. Here's an example of the London riots. So you start off with a, the keyword just collecting on London riots. And over time, what you want to be able to do is pick up these, these keywords that are potentially uh, can be problematic. Um, so this is uh, Tories out now, I believe, okay? Um, and so this was, uh, this was uh, around the time of uh, the elections. Okay. And so David Cameron is announced as the, 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 the you know, confirmed as the uh, uh, new leader of, of our country. And there's uh, quite a lot of, uh, of issues around that uh, in London at that time. Okay. And this is a particular interest for law enforcement, uh, certainly. They want to be able to detect whether there's going to be riots, um, apart from using, uh, you know, their informants and uh, the traditional methods of policing. They need to be able to monitor things like, uh, like, online social network feeds as well, okay? So we detect that and we add it to our, our list of, uh, of keywords so that we can uh, collect um, that information. How do we do that, okay? Well, essentially, we, we've tried a few different things that have worked with uh, varying amounts of, uh, of uh, accuracy, but uh, the, the, the current uh, uh, state of the art is, uh, is a particular keyword adaption algorithm, which starts with some initial keywords, and then it basically looks through, uh, it, it collects uh, information on, on, on other keywords and the counts of them, and any counts uh, and that are particularly high that look like they're candidate keywords, um, what we do is we actually do a similarity, uh, similarity to the initial keywords. Well, if you look at that, well, what does Saatchi 2014 and metal count, how similar is that? Okay? In terms of, of, of doing a, a similarity analysis, unless you had an actual dictionary of everything that you know, mapped to Olympics, it's, it's difficult to do. Okay, well, you could say, well, why don't we, uh, uh, we'll have that dictionary and uh, we'll say, yes, metals, gold, things like that. But remember, this is Twitter. It's freeform. 
freeform language. Okay? So we can't actually predict what the tags are going to be. And so what we actually do is once we have a candidate list of, 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 uh, of words is that we go back to Twitter and we query back and do a similarity measure on the top 100 tweets generated by this keyword. Okay? Anybody want to make a guess as to why we need to do that? Well, so what we do is we do a similarity. We take the, the last hundred of, of Sochi 2014, last hundred tweets that contain that, and the last hundred of tweets of the metal count, uh, and do a similarity analysis there. Okay? And the reason that that has to be done is noise. Okay? What you find if you don't do this is that you get lots and lots of keywords that appear like team follow back, okay? um, follow back this, or uh, BBC News. Okay? Things that aren't specifically relevant to what we're looking for. Okay? It might be that they're, they're not, like BBC News might be reporting, that's fine, but we actually don't want to follow BBC News because they're also reporting on a thousand other stories. Okay? Uh, we don't want just all that information cluttering up our Twitter feed. Okay? So finally, we, uh, that allows us to create a, a list of emerging te uh, hashtags to, 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 to follow. Okay? And so here's just a, a little uh, indication of our results, okay? And so what you have here is uh, our extra uh, event-related tweets that we managed to collect above and beyond what we would have collected if we had just used a, a, a baseline um, collection mechanism. And importantly, also noise, okay? I, I'm not going to go... So the green line is actually one of our earlier um, algorithms that, that also did collection as well. And you can see that it was really prone to picking up lots and lots of noise. It would, it would occasionally go off onto wild tangents and get lots of things that were not at all related to uh, what we wanted to collect. So the other thing, the final thing in, in this particular area is, is, is allowing real-time sub-event detection uh, during an event scenario from social media. Okay? So what we have here is we have a, a social media feed going on. This is the Glastonbury feed. Okay? And the sub-events, of course, are that the WHO headlines Glastonbury. And then you can see uh, at one point while this was playing it w during the announcement that Stephen Hawking was to play Glastonbury. And what we want to be able to do is to detect those in, 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 in real time. Um, you can see using... Um, this is a little bit difficult because I'm not going to get into the details of, of, of event detection in social media, but essentially, okay, the results are, are kind of here. What we get here is using a particular event detection algorithm and using our new data set, we're, a bit, we're, we're able to detect more sub-events within uh, a particular data set. Okay? The last thing that I want to talk about is, uh, is uh, an area of detecting uh, pedestrian flocks using crowd sensors. Okay? And so what are pedestrian flocks? They're a very specific kind of, uh, of, of crowd. Um, they, the flocks are people that, that tend to move together as a unit. Okay? They walk side by side as long as the space is not crowded. And typically, an individ individuals within the same group will move at the same speed and follow the same trajectories. Okay? Um, so if they are separated, as an example, um, I think, I'm trying to think if there's an example here, but uh, if they do have to break up to go around, let's say, another person who's walking uh, at cross, cross purposes to them, uh, they'll reform really quickly after they're, they're separated. Okay? The other interesting thing is that they often synchronize their gait as well, depending on how big the flock is. So some of the early work with detecting flocks uh, basically looks at, at very small flocks uh, and uh, looks at collecting a variety of different sensor information, Wi-Fi, compass, and accelerometer, and uh, they define a, a pedestrian flock as a moving cluster that exists for a specific time and contains more than a certain number of people. Okay? And what they do is they, they look at, at clustering that information. So they collect the, the Wi-Fi signal, and they collect the accelerometer and the, the compass, and they use two different kinds of clustering in order to create clusters for each individual feature. Okay? They use um, 
agglomerative hierarchical clustering for the Wi-Fi data, and they use density joint clustering for the accelerometer and compass. There's very specific reasons they do that, but I won't bore you with why. Okay? Uh, but, of course, the challenge then is that they've got three different sets of clusters, right? and they've got to somehow merge those <laughs> to create a, an actual uh, candidate set. And what they do is they use majority uh, voting and temporal clustering to finally detect their flocks. Okay? And they do a good job of it. Okay? Um, we're looking at being able to detect uh, sensing groups in, in, in crowds as well. And one of the things that, that we want to be able to do is use all those mobile sensors, proximity accelerometer to detect social groups in crowd without video. Okay? Um, and why do we want to do it without video? Well, there's lots of places that you can't use video. Uh, it's not necessarily economically feasible to kit out an entire park with video cameras all of the time. Okay? Um, so video requires a lot of infrastructure set up. Okay? And so what the aim is, uh, I think I've missed my little video here, but the aim is to, to detect group composition, number, size, and trajectory based on only those mobile sensors. So. To that effect, what we've currently taken a look at is gate synchronization and accelerometers. And what we want to do is analyze this phenomena in pedestrian uh, groups of two or three. Okay? This is just a, a preliminary study. I know that flocks contain more than three people, okay? uh, but we need to, to start somewhere. And so what we did is we just went down the road to the park. Okay? And uh, we've got uh, a couple different people. We've got scenario one. Uh, with two people who, who walk, uh, do this particular walk through, uh, through Milan Park. And then we have scenario two, which contains three people. We insert a third person in between the two, and they walk in, in kind of a, a, a V shape. And so what we want to know is, is there detect detectable synchronization in their gait? And the, the answer is yes. Uh, yes, there is. Okay? Um, and so in this particular study, it is relevant and it is important that the, the, the participants are of a similar size and weight and height, okay? uh, because you, you go into a whole minefield of, of problems when, when uh, you're looking at different, uh, different heights and different weights. You can imagine a child walking with an adult. Okay? Their, their gait is going to be significantly different um, than the other one. But we... Preliminary results seem to think that uh, seem to indicate that th I suspect that there will be some synchronization, just not the kind that we saw uh, in our study. So what we looked at is scenario one. This is the the, the Pearson's correlation of uh, uh, of uh, the two participants, uh, participant one and participant two. Okay, and you can see that there are discernible windows. Okay, where participant one and participant two are in sync. Okay. Three people is a little bit more of a minefield. Okay? You can see that there, you actually get into problems with three people. Okay? With three people, you can see that uh, in this particular window, we've got uh, participant one and participant two in sync. Okay? Um, so there's, there's, there's three different lines here. Okay? It's quite hard to see. But you've got uh, participant one and participant two, participant two and participant three. So this is actually participant two and participant three. Um, and so what you're looking at is the sync between them. And uh, there's a couple of windows there as well. And finally, uh, we have a, 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 a window here. So in the end, what, what we reckon is that accelerometer sync has a lot to do with things like gaze, head orientation, and gestures between people. Okay? It depends on whether or not they're interacting with each other. Um, and uh, and uh, so we think that that has a significant factor in gait, which means that if you're going to use accelerometer readings in terms of detecting pedestrian flocks, the important take-home message is you can't do it alone. Okay? You need to use other sensors and use sensor fusion uh, to do it. So what are we planning on doing? Well, we're, we're going to look at iBeacons and Bluetooth Smart, the gyroscope and magnometer to, to see whether or not we can get better readings on people. We also want to see whether or not using that we can actually detect presence of people who aren't carrying sensing devices, invisible people. Okay? And so for that, what we want to do is we've got people with sensing devices, a person without it, and over time as they move, okay, we want to be able to detect that the, the, the composition of this group actually contains five people rather than just four. Okay? Some initial looks at, at, at how we're going about doing it. We're building proximity graphs. Okay? So proximity graphs are how far each person is with each other, how often they interact. 
And then over time, you start looking at the movements and you start classifying them into to, to time graphs and looking at how often this group of people is together to find out whether or not you can, you can get a cluster of individuals that, 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 that move throughout time. Okay? Um, I think I'm probably running out of time here, but you take these graphs. The other important thing to, to, to note here is that these graphs are often very context dependent as well. Okay? Um, so what does that mean? Well, this graph could be very relevant for uh, this particular scenario um, at, uh, let's say this is an exposition, but if it was actually uh, in a train station or something like that, the proximity graph, a proximity graph like this we could model would, might look very similar, but actually have very different movement uh, characteristics than, uh, than in this particular environment. Okay? Finally, we've got cha some challenges, and I, I've not really touched on it too much. I, I've mentioned a little bit about privacy and trust, okay? but that's actually a really big issue in mobile crowd sensing. Okay? Um, so users are not necessarily willing to, to, uh, to disclose all or some of their, their sensor information. Okay? And we need to be able to uh, give guarantees on privacy. How do we anonymize data? So in terms of a GPS trace, it's not enough to just anonymize it. Okay? If I have a GPS trace of myself, of my journey here this morning, fine, you remove any details about my phone and things like that. But the point is that you've still got location and time. Well, it's not very hard to trace back and find out where I live and find out you can probably, once you find that out, you can go to other sources and find out exactly who I am. Okay? Um, so there's a lot of issues in terms of, of how we have this guarantee on privacy to users. Okay? There has been research done on this front about trying to remove the timestamps, as an example, um, as an, uh, in terms of, of trying to anonymize it. But it's still uh, very early uh, for that. Um, we need to trust the quality of information provided by crowdsourced uh, information. So why is that a problem? Okay? Well, the recent Ashley Madison, everybody familiar with the Ashley Madison thing that happened recently? Okay? Uh, so Ashley Madison was a company that, did a, that, that does a questionable moral things, which is, allows married people to hook up. You register on the website so that you can have an affair, essentially. Okay? So, Ashley Madison got hacked, and some people say, well, some people say it's an insider job, but, uh, but essentially, people, the reaction, pe people's reactions to it were, well, they deserve to be, that it was morally wrong. Well, the point is that we should all be really concerned. It's, it, it doesn't matter what you think of whether or not you should be able to have a website to do that. The point is that it's not actually illegal, at least where it was. <laughs> Maybe in other countries it is, okay? But it's not actually illegal, and that's our information they're spilling, okay? So why am I bringing that up? Well, with crowdsourcing, you might say, well, well it doesn't matter people. Who, I mean, who's going to spoof a, a pollution rating or, or something like that? But think about it a little bit further. Who's going to spoof a po pollution rating? Well, if I'm a competing company that produces something similar, um, and I might want to, to you know, get some users to go out and, and send wrong pollution readings to, to a crowdsourced application so that it can drive my competitor out of business because people are going to start using me because I'm the more ecologically friendly or green solution. Um, battery life. That's a big one I've already mentioned. I won't go into any more. Sensors are expensive and resource intensive, so how we use them is very important, uh, which also brings us to architectural issues which have privacy implications as well. So uh, centralized versus decentralized processing. If we're going to offer privacy to our users, actually probably the only way to do it in the end is to do all our processing decentralized so that their location information and things like that isn't stored in the same location um, and uh, perhaps doesn't even ever part from their phone. But that's got issues too. Okay. Uh, lastly, sensor fusion. It's hard to combine sensors. Okay. Um, I, how do we do it? How, how do we make sure that it, it's accurate? And how do we actually incorporate it with things like online social uh, network information? Okay? What guarantees are there that the microsensor data and the, and the social sensor data are about the same thing? Um, and user acceptance. So in terms of a, a lot of things, we need to incentivize users to install apps, okay? which is hard to do, notoriously, as you saw that one study uh, about the, the, the festival that they collected Bluetooth traces. They only managed to incentivize 155 people out of 30,000. It's pretty low. Okay? Um, so we have to face data sparsity, or we need to ambiently sense data, which also gets us into issues of, whether, of how much awareness there is from our users. And I will stop now before there's no time left for any questions.